thank you very much. It's a privilege, it's a privilege to be here today. Uh, I had a great trip up yesterday or the day before. Uh, weather was great. Uh, I guess uh, I become an expert because I broke 12 hours. You know, so that maybe uh, makes me able to talk about this a little bit. Uh, just a farmer. We've tried lots of different things. We've had lots of failures. Not too many successes, but we're still in business, you know. So this is a picture of our family farm, and I kind of call it the oasis among the desert because if you look around it, all of our neighbors are still conventional tillers, you know. Don't know why. Two or three miles down the road, we got guys using cover crops and beyond. Works really well. So uh, we own 161 acres. We operate 1,000 acres of cropland which consists of corn, soybeans, and small grains. Uh, we're also happen to be in the fastest growing county in the state of Ohio for development. Each year for the last 15 years, we've lost more than 4,000 acres of prime farmland to development. Uh, this fall, when we finished up harvesting, we lost 100 acres on uh, November the 25th when we finished shelling corn, and today, there's 25 homes set on that field. So that's how fast they can grow uh, when you want to do development work, you know. Uh, I'm old enough now and I've done it for 50 years, so sometimes I like to reminisce, you know. We don't realize how hard it was when we first started. This is my first uh, corn planter. I bought it in 1969. And everybody says, well, how much horsepower does it take? Well, it takes two horsepower per row. You know, and uh, that was before monitors were made, so we had a couple guys walking behind making sure we exploded the seat trench and the seat was falling in. And we was lucky enough every now and then uh, we'd get a little extra nutrients from those horses, you know. Uh, but things, you know, things have changed, so, you know, there's no excuse today because any piece of, or any color, or any piece of equipment you buy today, you can actually do no till with, you know. This was our first no-till drill. You know, it's called a zip seeder. We improved for lot. We improved the pastures by using this. There was more concrete box, uh, concrete box in that box than an actually held seed. You know, but today we have this to work with. We have technology today. We have guidance today. We have good seed placement. You know, we have all kind of monitors telling what's going on. So as far as I'm concerned, there's really no excuse not to try it. It's proven that it works, you know. So this is just a shot of what we can look for. In the forefront of the picture, you'll see the cover crop for next year's corn crop. In the background, there was cover crop and the kind of yields we can expect. Our county average is about 147 bushels of the acre. And we've been producing about 200, 190 to 200 bushel of corn for the last four or five years under our no-till cover crop sequence. Uh, as we began to work with this in the 70s, uh, it was not much known. So we tried different cover crops as single species. You know, so what we're going to talk about here is what we use for the, to help loosen the soils, to curb erosion, most of the farms we farm are highly erodible, like around here that we grew up. I saw those rolling hills and, and everything, so I'm assuming there's some erosion here. Uh, so we started with winter peas, found out they were really good, did a lot of things for us. In our atmosphere, is 90 or 75 percent nitrogen. Why can't we utilize some of that nitrogen to grow corn? So by doing using legumes in our rotation we can capture some of this nitrogen. Why do I say that? As we look at this, you know, we have the root of the, uh, of the winter pea. It's a tap root, and there's a pencil laying there, so it shows you about the size of, of the roots. That's a nine inch subtle profile. So we have nitrogen nodules at the two inch level. We have a lot of them at the four to five inch level, and then at the nine inch level, we have nitrogen there. So what does that mean for David? We plant the corn right here at the inch and a half, two inch level. So when that first corn seedling root comes out, guess what? It can find this nitrogen that's organic. But the 
corn plant really likes. It doesn't have to do anything to it. It can grow on it. When it's knee high and we're talking about yield and making a plant, you know, four to five inches deep, there's more of our root mass right here. We move into August. We're talking about stress. We're talking about setting grain. Guess what? We got nitrogen right here for it. And this is all accumulated from this plant from the nitrogen that's collected from the atmosphere. You know. But we move on, we spoke to Harry Vetch. Harry Vetch is a nice legume plant. Works really well. It tangles pretty good on the corn planter equipment. You know? Sometimes it's hard to get rid of. But sometimes you learn to face these problems and you learn to go on, you know. Another one I like really well is Crimson Clover. Don't know whether it would survive here or not, but we really like it. The reason I like it so well, I saw it in Kentucky, which is about uh, 250 miles south of me. At a meeting I went to and I stopped at a feed mill and I bought a bag out and brought it home. And I planted it and I called my professor at Ohio State University and I says, I bought this crimson clover, tell me about it. Well, David, he says, I'll just tell you what, it won't grow north of the Ohio River. Well, man, I spent money wrong, but guess what? It grows really nice. You know? And guess what you can do? You got grandkids, and you happen to have a farmer's market, or you have a floor, a place that sells flowers. You put ten of them in a bundle, charge five bucks for it. Farmer's market. When, when Chris was a little boy, he used to take those and his other brother go to farmer's market. They sell about 30 or 40 bundles at five bucks a piece. Grandpa never saw the money, but they had fun with it, you know. <laughs> so what do we find? As we look at legume crops, and as we do this research, how do we know what's going on? But when I talk to universities, I said, well, Mr. Brandt, you've got to take those plants and bury it because the top's where the nitrogen is. When I talked to the professor, I said, hey, the only thing I got is a no-till planter with a John Deere 3020, a 300-gallon Walsh sprayer, and a John Deere 45 combine. That's what I started with, guys, gals. You know, how am I going to plow it under? Well, I guess, Mr. Brandt, you're not going to get much nitrogen. So what we did for nine years, we set all these cover crops out in plots. We went from zero nitrogen in the plot to 200 pounds. Used the weigh wagon, eventually got a yield monitor. So wherever the red clover equaled the same as it did where the 200 pound of nitrogen was, I figured that was the pounds of nitrogen that plant produced. We did it for nine years, and that's a nine year average. So if you look at that chart there, and you look at winter peas, and hairy vetch, and crimson clover, you know, you're looking to accumulate maybe 200 to 300 pounds of nitrogen. Now the two bottom plants on the bottom, I don't know whether it'll work here, because they're warm season legumes. The other legumes above that are cool season legumes, so they'll grow where the climate's cooler. A warm season legume needs 85 to 100 degrees, and really no rainfall. So if you happen to be in that area, maybe you're dry in August, maybe you're hot in August, it may work for a little bit. You know, our cow peas will get six to eight foot tall. You know, our sun hip will get nine to 10 foot tall, has a yellow bloom on it, and it survives that warm weather. So when I put the two warm season legumes plus the three or four cool season legumes, now we can produce or capture, not produce, capture about 400 units of nitrogen. Now my professor at Ohio State University said, well, how much can you count on, David? I said, I don't know. But if I can count on half that, I'll feel really good. And you know, today's market, we can't buy nitrogen for less than a dollar ten cents a pound. I don't care what form. It's all a dollar ten cents a pound. So imagine if I can grow, or retain, or store, or capture from the atmosphere, half of that, we can do pretty well. On our farm, we only use 20 pounds of nitrogen to grow corn. 
that we have to buy. If you're buying, if you're putting 200 pounds on, you're spending $200. I don't need to tell you that. You can figure that yourself. You know, so why not look at this? It's a little late for this year, but maybe there's some things we could do to think about happening next year. Or maybe there's time enough here to think about maybe using a cereal crop like oats mixed with winter peas or spring peas. Plant them as soon as the ground gets fit, maybe before the ground gets fit. Maybe it's frozen up to hold up the drill and the tractor. The drill will slice the ground, plant them half to three quarters of an inch deep, get them up, delay corn planting a couple weeks, get them nine, ten inches tall, and pick up 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen. More than pay for the cover crop and reduce your expenses a little bit. Some ideas. I'm not saying it's going to work. You know, tomorrow it might, shut, it might be 80 degrees and you want to plant corn. I don't know. You know. So here's another chart I found that just gives all the goods. So there's a whole variety of things we can use out there as a cover crop to capture the nitrogen from the atmosphere. And I think these times is what we need to look at and see what would work in your operation. You know. Some of them take longer to establish. Look at sweet clover. You're not going to get much nitrogen from sweet clover in a three or four month window. It takes about 12 to 14 months for it. Most of these others will do it in a short period of time. So in the spring, this is what we plan into. The, the purple flowers of hairy batch. The red flowers of crimson clover. The white flowers of balanza. We like balanza clover, and that was an action that we found four years ago. We put some out in the field. We got to walk in the field early spring because we don't plow, we don't disc. So you have to take that time that you do that as tillage and walk in the field and see what's happening. You know, take your shovel with you, dig down and look at the roots. Look and see what's going on. You know. And all of a sudden we notice that in some parts of the field where maybe the size of the table that you're setting at, all we found was balance of clover growing. We walk up in the field another foot or two or two or three steps, and we start seeing hairy batch of crimson clover. Take another step up to the field, then we find rye. Well, guess what? We found out that the balance of clover was growing in really wet soils, but the rest of the stuff didn't survive. You know, so we had a green growing plant there that gave us roots, that gave us infiltration, and give us some nitrogen. You know. So what we do, we pull in with the corn planter, we start planting, we take our crop roller, roll it down. If it's in bloom like this, we will bypass the first herbicide pass. Wait till the crop comes up. Maybe we've got enough biomass there to hold down the weeds all summer long. We'll make that decision when the corn's about 12 to 18 to 20 inches tall. If there's nothing out there, there's no use to spend another $30 an acre for chemical and just let her go. And put about 20 pounds of nitrogen on because we found that seems to be the magic number for us to produce 200 bushel corn. We start putting sunflowers in a mix because our friendly conventional neighbors would like to pay more money for rent than we do, they would go to our landlords and they said, well, look at that mess Mr. Brant's got in the field. It's green, it's ugly. I'll give you $5 more an acre and I'll make it brown all summer long for you. You know, we lost a few fields. All of a sudden we found out we put a pound of sunflowers in. They get beautiful. People want to stop and take pictures. You don't want to do that along a major highway because it can create a problem. So we always put it in the back 40. We advertise that we're going to do it. We can actually sell time slots to take photo shots. You know? A half hour photo shot costs a hundred bucks. And there's a waiting list on the Grand Farm. You know? There you go. If you got population, you got a baby. I'm serious. We have neighbors down in southern Ohio that have that earn seven thousand dollars a week setting up time slots on sunflowers. People love to see it. Guess what happens with your 
We opened landlords. I didn't tell you, I had 27 landlords. 17 of them were over 80 years old. 14 of those were all single ladies, widows. Five of those sunflowers in a mason jar with a red ribbon wrapped around it every Monday morning for a month. Dave Brandt can do no wrong. <laughs> I never have to worry about losing that land. No. That's the interesting thing. What do we find out? You know, all of a sudden, you know, we pay the grounds to help us, to advise us. We ain't got time to learn all this stuff. He comes to me and says, David. He says, I'm really aggravated at you. I said, what's the matter, Carl? Well, he says, your soil samples the last two years has been showing more zinc. And he says, you're buying zinc from another damn co-op and not buying. I says, Carl, you know what we're doing. I said, we're not buying zinc. So we sat down with the soil samples. And he says, what are you doing? I said, we put sunflowers in this field. Well, guess what? We figured out without a university telling us that a sunflower, a pound per acre, will pull up five to six pounds of zinc. We're a zinc deficient in Ohio. That's a $20 savings, not to buy five pounds of zinc. You know? I don't know where it comes from. I don't care where it comes from. It was just there. It worked. You know? Those are things we see happening as we improve soil health, improve infiltration, improve diversity, lower the tillage factors, you know. In 69, I worked with Steve Groff, you probably heard about him. He was the one to come up with the tillage reddish. Now we have all kinds, we have sod buster, clod buster, there's all kinds of reddishes out there. But guess what? Don't do what I did, or you're gonna be doing this somewhere else. We had the biggest one we ever grew. It was five inches in diameter, 47 inches long of taproot with six foot of root. You know, I went to the soil and water office, or SWCD office, or whatever you want to call it here. I let the man take a picture of me. It went somewhere. They say it's the internet. Now all of a sudden I'm supposed to be an expert speaker. You know? <laughs> so don't ever brag about what you do, guys. We're going to have to talk about it. You know, but this is the reddish we grow. You know, and here we plant with the planter, like you plant corn. We have one row of reddish, and run well, uh, winter peas, hairy, uh, hairy batch, cow peas, whatever, whatever will grow nitrogen. You know? And what do we find out as we watched and grew, and watched these plants grow? They get like this, a 24-inch tuber, which becomes a script hill machine for David. They're four and a half inches apart each seed. So it's just like a strip till machine. You know, they loosen the ground. There's what it looks like, guys and gals. You know, that's a three quarters of a pound of reddish. When I did this, reddish was five dollars a pound. Now they're about a dollar forty or a dollar thirty. That's seven, three quarters of a pound per acre planted precisionally. That's twelve pounds of winter peas planted per season, three inches apart, for a total cost of 12 bucks an acre, with a corn planter that you plant soybeans with. The only thing you got to buy is however many odd plates you need for sorghum. The sorghum plate plants winter peas, or plants uh, reddishes, and you're off and running. Look how nice it looks. You know, if you happen to have a lot of manure, just use oats instead of winter peas. Let the manure help, let the oats capture the nitrogen and the nutrients from the manure go all the way. But what I want to show you is look how it lifts the soil. Here, you know, it actually lifts that soil three to four inches in that row, if you can see it, you know. That's why I call it my natural strip tilts machine. No money spent. No diesel fuel. We plant the corn right in there. When you do this, remember one thing. In March and April, you're going to have the ugliest smelling fields in the whole countryside. It's going to smell like a natural gas leak. So be aware. You know. Somebody will say you've got natural gas problems. Great feed. Cattle eat it. 
Don't walk behind the cattle because it comes out of them just like it smells out of coming out of the ground. You know? What do we find out? Dr. Lafitte Gisler from Ohio State runs Pike and Research Farm. He's worked with us for 15 years. For five years he did this study. I would call him two days before we're going to plant corn. He'd send his interns up. I only met him once or twice. He'd always send his interns. They'd come up, take soil samples. Four days later, five days later, they'd call back and say, Mr. Brandt, this is what we found in your field when you were planting corn. 250 pounds of nitrogen. 23 pounds of phosphorus. 230 pounds of potash. 60 sulfur, 150 calcium, 20 pound magnesium. If you guys know what it takes to grow corn, Mr. Brandt does not have to buy much nutrient to supply 200 bushel corn. Think about that today. Back in urea, you know, at about 10 a pound, phosphorus, 900. Potash at 800, lime at 40 bucks a ton spread. You know, that 150 pound of calcium found there is equal to 1,300 pound of lime spread every year. We've not spread lime on our home farm since 1973. Our pH is 7.1 on our home farm. Why can we get this done? We believe in a three year rotation. You know, I just wish now we had more than three-thirds of our farm in wheat. Because last week, Chris grabbed me and said, Grandpa, wheat's almost 12 bucks. You know, well, 12 buck wheat, and we can produce 90 bushel wheat. You know, and then put a cover crop in there to capture 95% of all the nutrients, lower your herbicide cost by 50%. Wheat may be a thing to look at. I'm not saying you need to, just think about what you're doing. Maybe putting the more diversity in your rotation. It's hard to grow a cover crop in a corn bean rotation. You don't have enough diversity. You only got two and a half weeks of growth. You get a plant about three inches tall with roots about eight inches deep. You know. Can you imagine after taking that wheat off? On July 23rd, this was planted in 2012. 2012 was the driest year we ever had in Ohio. 8.5 inches of water through the growing season. It was bone dry from July 1st till September 22nd. We went in and planted this 10 way species. The most rainfall it had during the time it grew was a quarter inch of water. 100 degrees that year during the summer. Look at the amount of biomass we produce. And we had roots just that deep. What does that mean to you? It means you got a lot of infiltration. You build a lot of carbon. That field right there changed organic matter in our field. One percentage. One total percent. Not one tenth. One percent. Our farm today has 8% organic matter. We started with a half percent in 71. As you look at these cover crops, it's not easy. If you want it easy, just do what you're doing, conventional tillage, beat it to death three or four times, burn up a lot of diesel fuel, own a lot of iron, but you don't have to manage. It'll grow. Put enough nutrients on it, it'll grow. You plant cover crop, you gotta learn how to manage it. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you to spend the time managing rather than doing tillage. 17 was a great year, a warm spring. Cover crops got big. This was not hard to handle. Plant the crop, roll the cover crop, no herbicides, no nitrogen, no starter fertilizer to speak of, maybe two gallons the acre. And we sort of were successful. 18, different year. Two days later, different year. Cover crop, 9, 10 inches tall. 
plant the corn. Guess what? Yes, we had to add fertilizer. Guess what? We had to add herbicides. We couldn't roll it. You've got to be flexible enough to understand. You know? I used to tell everybody it was easy. Everybody started trying and they call me, well, what I do is six and a half foot tall rye. Well, you just plant it. I don't you know. You never see it, you get worried. You know. This is the way it looks when we're planting corn. And that happens to be the frame of the planter. I told you grandson came back. He came back four years ago. I never will forget. We went out to lunch. We was planting. Everybody around us got green stuff. We said that it's a diner. And Chris said, Grandpa, he says, uh, how's it going? We got a red planter. Well, I says, Chris, you know, we're here to lunch. We've been here for half an hour getting ready to go back to the field. If we didn't have that red planter, we couldn't find it. You know? <laughs> so that was the reason for the red planter. You know. But look at this, guys. No dust. Look at that planter. Look at the tractor. Look how clean it is. That ride was six and a half foot tall. You see the mark in front of it from the row marker. We we're not fortunate enough to have guidance. We do have one now because Chris decided he's going to pay for it because Grandpa didn't have the money. You know, but works really well. You know, works really well. Yes, there's just a couple sleepless nights. You know, I'm learning to get over it. After 50 years, I'm learning to get over it. It'll come up. You know. So what do we find out? Corns were planted about uh, three and a half weeks apart. My neighbor's conventional corn, 97 degrees that day. This is still in June. The ground's compacted. We just had a half inch of rainfall the night before. You wouldn't tell it in that conventional field. Look how it's cracked open. If you look at the very edge of the leaves in that conventional field, they're yellow, so it's lacking for nitrogen. And beside it, we got a field of cover crop with corn about two to four inches tall. You can hardly see the rows. And it's 78 degrees. And guess what? At harvest time, we were seven bushel better than he was. We harvested the same day. He was running 21% moisture corn, and we was at 16. Why is that? We controlled the moisture in the soil. We kept it cool. Our critters did the work. And we produced a great crop. There's what it looks like, guys. No nitrogen. Cover crop land there. If you can get enough biomass mass on the ground, you can suppress the annual weeds and the grasses. Sometimes there's not enough, sometimes you have to go back and post some stuff. You know. What do we find out? I think this is really interesting. Especially if you graze livestock. The thing I want to tell you is ADM, cardio, and emoji don't give a damn about this page right here. They don't care. But if we could go from no fertilizer, 90% protein in the grain. Half rate fertilizer because my grandma says you can't grow corn without fertilizer, so I keep trying to show you we can. You know? So we put half rate on a field, part of the field. We lost almost a percent of protein. Full rate of fertilizer, which means, you know, we went to, we just read potash, we put AMS on, we did 250 pounds of nitrogen. We went to 7.5% protein. Neat thing about my neighbor, he's got big fields, and he's always got his wagon and his truck set along the road. So when he's the other end of the field, he can't see me. I reach up in his truck, take a step full of corn, send it off to be tested, and he's got 5% protein because he's a conventional farmer. My question to you is, from land grant universities, they keep telling us we have to produce more by 2050 to feed the world. My question to you is, Will we feed the world with 500 bushels of corn at 1% protein? Or will we feed the world with corn with 7, 8, 9, 10% protein? Which one do you want to eat? Cardboard or something that tastes good? Everybody says, well, it's more expensive. Well, here's our cost for regenerative agriculture on our farm. Cover crop seed after wheat costs us 25 bucks an acre. 
We do not use GMO. The reason we do not use GMO is if we plant it in a cover crop field, we'll lose 40 to 50 bushels of the egg. For some reason, GMO corns will not accept nutrients from the fungi that's in our fields. I don't know why. I do know why. You won't believe me. But the GMO corns do not have hair roots. They have big roots like spaghetti. If you don't believe me, try some of the GMO corn this year. Pull up a root and look at it. And then go to, if you got somebody that's got non-GMO, pull on their plants and look at them. The non-GMO have 10 to 15% more fibrous roots than the GMO plant does. That means the GMO varieties still yield the same and do as well. A little bit of NP and K, this is an average of the years, it's just not one year. That's not very much fertilizer, guys. Even though that was done in 18, that's still not very much fertilizer. That is our equipment cost, not replacement cost. Chris figured this out because he learned how to push all the buttons on the tractor, tells him how many gallons of fuel we use an hour, how much oil we use, how, many, how much rubber comes off the tires, all that good stuff that he likes to tell me about. I really don't care, but you know, it's there. So he figured it cost us $55 to maintain the corn planter, uh, the combine, and the sprayer, and the crop roller. Our average cash rent is $150. Today it's $200. That's how much has changed in four years. So our total cost in 18 was $384. Uh, seed, the corn was worth three dollars and eleven cents. Took one hundred seven bushel to break even. We averaged one ninety two. We made two hundred and sixty two dollars a. Not too bad a return. Can you do that today, even at seven dollar corn? Interesting thing. I had a young man. He's about forty years old. Called me Thursday night, and he said, "Mr. Brandy he says I got a problem." He didn't tell me acres of farm. He said, I spent $297,000 on operating money last fall, last year, to produce the corn and the beans and the wheat that I grow. This year I have to buy, borrow $900,000 operating money to plant the same number of acres. What can I do? I'm going to point with him next week to talk to him to see if we can help him. How do we know what we got? This is called a spad meter. They range from 200 to 900 bucks. The $200 one does the same thing the $900 one does, other than the 900 point keeps track of what you do. If this thing reads 42 parts per million of chlorophyll in the leaf at any stage of corn, we know on our farm that will produce 200 bushels. We have enough nitrogen to produce 200 bushel corn unless something happens to the crop during the growing season. And you can see there we get an excess. You know, here's another tool we use. This is called a Sabita flag. What you do, you go out in the field, you stick the flag in the ground, you see that plastic can there? You take it, turn it over, push it in the ground so it can't get air. Make sure you mark it in the field because if you put it in the field of standing corn, it's stuck to find that little half pint jar. So make sure you remember where you can put it. 24 hours later, go back. The flag changes colors. The color codes there are on the chart. Anything higher than a three, you have plenty of nitrogen for the corn. What this is doing is checking respiration of the soil. In other words, how much carbon dioxide is leaving the soil equals the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil for the plant to use. A pretty good way to check things. How important is corn varieties? These are things we're doing on our farm to figure out. You know? I think you need to do this on your own farm. I really like seed corn companies. You know, Pioneer, Bayer, Monsanto. They'll sell you the best corn they got from the blackest damn soil, the highest production soil, I'll tell you it'll make three to four of them bushel of the egg. Now we bring it back to our place. It's got lots of cover crop. 
we got lots of nutrients, and it falls on its butt. But, if we're looking at spectrum variety, and that's what we're looking at. This company was the only company I could find that would listen to us so that we could help them improve their varieties. So as you look at these varieties here, you know, here's 9% protein. If you're milking cows, feeding steers, feeding hogs, feeding sheep, feeding ostriches, emus, whatever, do you want this variety of corn here at 8? Or do you want this variety here, or would you like to have this one? This is only one year for some reason. Spectrum dropped that variety. Maybe it was too damn good. You know? If you mentioned 12%, 11% protein, finishing all state 12. Don't have to buy much feed meal to finish them hogs. You know. Some other things we're doing. Fun thing, I work with two FA chapters. Been doing it for years. What we do, we let each kid in a chapter plant one round of corn with a corn planter. I got to set beside him so he don't run over somebody. But he gets to steer and he gets to watch it. Then he comes back in the fall and shells it. In 2012, we were planting, but we had planted beans before we went to the FFAs to plant corn. So we left the bean boxes full of beans and put the corn plate in and we was planting corn and this young man crawled in the cab. And I think he was a freshman and he said, Mr. Brandon, he said, you come to school in the, in the fall and told us about how important cover crops were. And he said, I see you got soybeans in your corn planter boxes. I said, yeah, we plant beans. He said, you ever think about planting beans with corn? And I just didn't say another word to him. His turn was up, got out of him. We got done planting, the boy came over and he said, Mr. Brand, he says, I'm sorry I pissed you off. I said, well, you really didn't make me mad. I was just mad at myself. I never thought about that. You know? So here's what we did. We just turned the produce back on and planted beans beside the corn. This is a variety trial, so we got some different varieties. Same soil types, we'll do them out in the field. You know, here we go. Look at that, you know. Soybeans are grown, corns are grown, dark green. We shut, didn't put no nitrogen on it then. We knew it was going to grow, you know. It's that phase field, so it didn't make anything, don't matter. It didn't cost me anything. I learned, you know. Here it is, it's about, you know, it's tossed, it's big and silk, it's big and ears. If you look back in the corner row, it was so dense it actually killed the, the soybeans in the field. These are outside edges, you'll see them growing there along with the sunlight is. But here's the results, guys. And we've done this three years and repeated it. But look where we had soybeans grown with corn. Look at the yield with no nitrogen. We didn't put soybeans in and we put 140 pounds of nitrogen in. Now this is light clay soils, organic matter about 0.4, 0.5. You ask me why we lowered the yield? I'll tell you why we lowered the yield. We actually added 13 pounds of salt with 140 pounds of nitrogen. I think we burnt the roots off of that corn with that fertilizer because the fertility was so low in the soil. Other things we're looking at. Planting twin row wheat on 15 inch centers or 20 inch centers, come back in, plant two rows of soybeans. Two crops at once, multiple crops. Does it work? Yeah. How do I know it works? Look at there. That's our 15 inch wheat, 15 inch soybeans. Other things we're doing a 10 way species cover crop have to be harvested dry for seed, but we we're in seed business. And we put grain sorghum in. You know? My wife keeps telling me, so she passed away two years ago, she says, David, she says, we just got to have more money. She says, you're, you're just not making enough. These guys are double crop me to get 15 or 20 bushel, and we can, you know, I could buy a couch or a new freezer, a new, new dining room table. And I said, well, you just ain't ready to do that yet. So she says, why don't we try something that you can harvest? So we plant a grain sorghum with a cover crop underneath it. We, had, we harvested 1,300 or 1,312 pounds of sorghum. 
didn't know what the hell we was going to do with it. You know, it's like we build it till it come. Uh, you know, we had a whole bunch of sorghum, and we even had 4,000 bushel sorghum. Guess what? You get on the internet, you find a market. We were lucky enough to find a market that wanted for bird feed and 60 cents a pound times 1,200 pound the acre. Pretty good return on your investment, and we still have a cover crop going underneath there, collected in atmospheric nitrogen for next year's corn. Now, so we can do lots of things to help us build diversity. Sunflowers, these are the ones we planted with us. We plant our sunflowers in 30 inch rows with a planter now, wait three days, go back in with a girl, plant 10 way species. This is the only picture I had that really showed the sunflowers in rows. But this happens to be the Chinese from Beijing University. This is the Chinese ambassador of agriculture. This is the dean of Beijing University, and these are his agronomy students that came to our farm to learn about how they could do cover crops in China and what we could do. It was a real privilege to have them on our farm. Why do we want to talk about flowering plants? We want to bring beneficial insects. We have not used a fungicide or a herbicide going on 12 years. If you come to the farm, it's only a 12-hour drive, and more all welcome. I will actually give you a sweet net if you're there in the summertime, and we'll go out and identify better than 3,200 beneficial insects in one sweet net, and only three harmful ones. Why should we use a fungicide to kill everything? This is my buddy. Once we quit using neonics five years ago on seed corn and soybeans, we started seeing crab and beetle come back. When you plant rye, you'll see earthworms come back. I always said there must have been a pound of earthworm eggs in every bushel of rock because, man, they really multiply. Now I think we can have five or six crab and beetle for every bushel of cover crop we put out. Why is this bitter important? He eats 20 to 30 slugs a night. He'll eat 30 to 500 foxtail seeds a night. We've got a herbicide machine and an insecticide machine. If you've got neonics and you've got slugs, does not bother slug. He can ingest the neonics. It comes out of his body. When that thing bites it, he dies. That's why we have slug pressure sometimes. You do not have enough beneficials to take care of. We're going to switch gears and talk about how to grow soybeans. We love rye. I think rye belongs in, in front of soybeans. does not belong in front of corn. Because if you understand what corn is, and none of you do, I did it until about seven or eight years ago, corn is a warm season grass. And we're trying to keep treat it like a cool season grass. Damn it, we're out there in April. 40, 50 degree weather. Takes a month to get it up. You get the soil temperature up to 55 or 60. You plant your corners up in three days. It's growing fast. No insects bother it. It's laying there for 30 days in the ground. It comes up pea yellow. All of a sudden, you're going to see flea beetles. You're going to see army worms. You're going to see slugs, cutworms, working on it. If it's growing fast, it can outgrow up. You can plant brown. We don't like to. I was told to do this by the chemical rep. And we had just started here, and then we had a two and a half inch rainfall event. We got four rounds of soybeans planted. We finished planting wheat in that field in the fall. Reason is, there's no underground drainage. That stuff was brown. It acted like a tarp on there that had holes in it. You can't get sunlight or wind to dry the surface out. That's the problem, it's planting brown. Our weathermen to hide over what's going on. They get paid good, but they can't tell us. So here you can see the brown behind it, the green in front of it. 11 crucial difference between where we're planting green and where we're planting brown. <clears throat> the bigger it is for David, the better he likes it. 
You don't have to have it that big. But you know, the more biomass, the less weeds we have. You've seen this product, Rick Clark was here, he probably showed this to you. But what I want to point out was, look at the amount of biomass changes as you let this crop mature from 12 to 28, we go from 2,000 pounds to 6,000 pounds of biomass. That means you can suppress 30% more weeds by getting to 28 inches tall. Just imagine that. We're not talking about anything else out there, but how much nutrients he picked up. You know. This is my lovely wife. She loved the crop roll. That's a 30 John Deere, 71. I bought it when new and we're still running it. This turns it over three times on a tachometer. You know, she's got a 20 foot roller. She's running about seven miles an hour. You know, the only thing bad about this is I love her to help me. And you know, we're working hard day in, day out. And the only problem I got is I got hoof and mouth disease because she's worked hard all morning. We come in for lunch and I ask her when we walk in the door, what's for lunch? <laughs> don't seem to be, don't run, don't make a home run very easy. But look how nice that crop roller lays that down. I feel we need to lay this cover crop down so when that plant emerges, it doesn't get spindly. If you don't, you don't have to lay it down, it'll grow through it, but it'll get tall and spindly. If you roll it down, it'll work. Yes, sir? When are you planting this rye? When are we planting this rye? This will be planted in the fall. Okay. At one or eight? Uh, that is 40 pound an acre. Okay. And when, when is this? That would be uh, probably tail into May. Here comes the rye. Some of the rye springs back up, of course, because it wasn't quite rolling. It wasn't quite tall enough, big enough to be rolled. But here you can see the soybeans coming. You can see we've got a pretty good, clean path underneath there. And there's the field with no herbicides. About 60% of the time we're this lucky. 40% of the time we have to use a post herbicide. Cost, right cost is nine, non-GMO beans, no NP and K. The equipment cost is a little bit less. Uh, risk still the same. So 28 bushel to break even. We made $369.18. Not too bad a return. I think you'll have to agree. You know, let's get Where are we going to be today? We do a lot of work because people call us, what do you think about this variety? What do you know about this? And if we didn't do it, we couldn't answer the question. We try not to get the hip boots too high up on us, you know, when we're talking to people. So again, here's the corn and the cover crop. This is some data I did with a three-way cover crop at the top, no cover crop. This is all no-till, but no cover crop in the middle, and then a ten-way cover crop on the bottom section. We went from zero to 52 gallon, and you can see the, the amount of yield there. The 10 way blend paid the most dividend. Because with zero nitrogen, we had 164, and 52 gallon, we had four more bushels. Four more bushels did not pay for the nitrogen. Guys and gals. You know, is it all about yield? Not to me. It's all about what's left. I'm a guy that I want to sign the back of the check rather than the front. You know, if you want to sell, sign the front of day break, I'll keep signing them on the back. You know. So here's some plot work. We do this every year. These are different varieties that we try. Uh, this is the cost of, the, of getting them in. This is the, the variety days, day length varieties. Maturity numbers, uh, the dry yield, population, things I want to show you. You know, we're so smart. We got a we got a eight row planter with seven splitters. Uh, of course, you know you got to change the monitor, guys. If you're going from 15 inch rows to 30, 
We've got to in the first two varieties, the three varieties. But what I want to show you was even at 16,000 plants, 108 day corn, we still made $56 an acre. We didn't lose at 16,000. You know? What I want to get to, look at these 111 day varieties from this company. One variety is a racehorse that works really well in conventional tillage. That produces 300 bushels of corn in Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. A racehorse, you bet mine. The other one's a workhorse. Only thing different was right in this plot, guys. Now, the soil may change a little bit, but not a whole bunch. But look, variety A, $59 return on the investment. Variety B, $228. Which one of them would you like to buy? You know? When you ask Spectrum, do they know that? No. You need to do some of this stuff on your own. Most everybody's got a new enough combine, it's got a yield monitor. I don't care whether it's calibrated or not. Don't matter to me. If you see a difference, you know there's a difference. If you don't have a yield monitor, but you got a window in the cab, take a magic marker, the first variety, mark the window. The next variety, if it yields above that or below it, it's significantly better or significantly worse. You don't know how much, but you know it's better. You know, these are things we have to learn in production ag. Maybe someday land grant universities will understand how important multiple species covers are and do some research for us. But as of yet, I have not found any university anywhere doing this. How do we get it accomplished? With a high boy cedar. Like it better than an airplane. How else can we do it? Understand your herbicide program? Guess what? We're learning we can do it at Leyby. You know? Our Gronus goes nuts. You know, one damn weed will cost you half a bushel, David. it? Well, guess what? You put lagoons there, they give you a half a bushel plus. You know? But if you use the wrong herbicide and spend 20 bucks an acre to sow a cover crop in there and it all dies, you're just out of luck. So understand what you're going to do. You have to plan ahead. You can't decide on uh, July 1st that you're going to intercede and go by the sea. But here's some results. Corn going back to corn. Put the goons in. Guess what? They grow. This is having to be radishes and rye. Going back to soybeans next year. This was a soybean field that we had blue on cover crop seed just a yellow leaf drop. You can barely see the plants at harvest time. It's about two inches tall. This is two and a half weeks later after the soybeans were cut. There's rye. Again, this is where I'm the best. Outstanding my field. How do we utilize it? If you got livestock, guess what? Take half of what you grow. Daily gain of 500 pound stalkers, 4.7 pounds a day. Eat cover crop. Look at them, they love it. You know, I feel like that, the flies can't find them. You want a crop roller? We sell them. Four bags crop roller, $39.95, I'll take orders. You know? You want to do this. We got these for backyard gardeners. 100 bucks a day, take your rent, roll it. Or crop down. Or you could be like Rick Clark, a 65 footer, roll 7,000 acres of cover crop organically. Yeah. Here's our soils. Looks like there's soils here. The thing of it is, if you look right down here, that's our yellow clay. 24 inches of blood of dark colored soils today. There's what it looked like when we started. Here's what it is today. A half percent organic matter. Man, I had 25 pounds of nitrogen in the soil to use in 71. Today, this is 8 percent organic matter. Now I have better than 200 pounds of nitrogen available to whatever crop I put there. Do we need to build soils? Yes. 
What does that bring to us? Mycorrhizal fungi. Only fungi you can see without a microscope. But look how it's entangled with the roots of the corn. It's feeding this corn plant. Didn't understand that until a few years ago. What does it mean to me? Neighbors feel. Not condemning, but there goes these nutrients. One ton of soil loss today cost the farmer nine dollars and thirty cents. His nutrients lost. Average for the United States is 5.4 ton. Do the math. Here's ours. Here's my neighbor's field, 80 acre field right there. This is a ditch that goes between us and him. Our water goes that way. Here's our water. Look at the amount of difference in the flow. From here, runoff, to here, infiltration. Look how clean the water is. You know. Little fun things we do. Everybody likes to talk about procedure planning. This is my 2020 planner. We got a fluted color, got a seat blade, we got a press wheel, we got a red mark on that wheel, we got a funnel right there, we got a box of pumpkin seeds right there, we got a 200 pound weight right there. By 10 o'clock, he's bitching, so I give him air conditioning. You know? He sees the red mark, he throws two pumpkin seeds down the hole. At, four, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it's hot, it's dry. We can't get it to go in the ground, we transfer the weight, take the 200 off, put the 400 on, then we're off and running. Yeah. What kind of results do we get? There it is, guys. The reason I'm orange, the white ones are worth twice as much money. A you pick patch, seven acres, gross dollars, $42,000 on seven acres. Gross dollars. I ain't going to tell you what the color map was. You know, a couple bucks. You know, how else can we do it? You got a garden? You want to grow clean produce? Roast bread, rye, curry veg, tomatoes. 20% more productivity. Sweeter tomatoes have more amino acids, have more protein than tomatoes growing underneath plastic. We do diversity things. We've got a seed cleaning operation, we mill stuff. We bag, sell mini balls. True off, trying to help producers. Last slide. A spoonful of soil has this in it, and you can read. You know? Just imagine what an uh, acre of soil has. Are you feeding your livestock today the right protein on top of the ground? My question to you is are you feeding the animals and the critters? Because this represents four cows and four calves. Body weight below the soil. Please learn how to protect it. Thank you very much.